Okay, a bit late, but we're going. Welcome to the Hay Memorial Lecture this morning. This morning I'm going to tell you a story about a role model, a person we feel is a role model for sports biomechanics. And Dr. Finney and I hope that at the end of this one hour session, you will appreciate why the Hay Award Committee selected Pavel Komi as the 2019, 2019 recipient, posthumously, of the Hay Memorial Award. The award recognizes how the study of biomechanical principles in the extraordinary context of sport informs our understanding and directly impacts performance. And the Hay Award also focuses on research on central questions related to musculoskeletal, neuromuscular, physiological systems that inform uh, behavior at the extremes of performance. Pavel Komi was a renowned international scientific leader, a professor emeritus and former head of the Department of Biology of Physical Activity at the University of Evascular, and a scientist who, in keeping with the spirit of the Jim Hay Award, dedicated his professional career of over 50 years to the, to the uh, study of elite sport competition. His fundamental approach to science was holistic by design with a focus on the interdependence of the neuromuscular and musculoskeletal systems acting collectively as an integrated sensory motor system in neural control and in movement control. Our time is short this morning, too short to describe completely the scope of his work. So my individual contribution this morning is gonna focus on three aspects of his career that I believe describe him as a person, who he was, his approach to sports science and sport performance, and the subsequent impact of his work and his research on the area of sports biomechanics. To take us uh, a little back and, and look at his curriculum vitae and provide some initial insight into his uh, career, our discussion this morning a setting for this discussion. I've gathered some information from his uh, CV. And you can see clearly he's very productive. Over 900 citations, you can read the uh, different categories that they're in. Very active in international societies. President of four that are listed here. He's a Moybridge Award winner for the ISB. He's an honorary member of the ISB the Philip Noel Baker Research Award for ICHBE, founding member of the European College of Sports Science, and I have a star there, and we're gonna come back to that in a little bit. Citation Award from the American College of Sports Medicine, and an Olympic Order Award from the IOC. And yes, he did manage to find time to organize eight international congresses, the International Society of Biomechanics, tw two times, and he was an honorary doctorate degree seven times. The first aspect of his career I will talk about is his interdisciplinary approach to the study of an integrated physiological system. This matches very closely with the Hay Award as we stated on the second slide. And I believe Pavel's career epitomizes this award. I've also highlighted three words here interdisciplinary, integrated, and interface, because I believe they describe why Pavel was so immensely successful in his professional life. While Pavel Comey approached the study of the elite human performance from different perspectives, addressing a range of scientific questions, I'm gonna use the tricep sore as noted here, and I know you all know where the tricep sore is. Um, because uh, to illustrate my point about the importance of interdisciplinary research. In this case, for example, the central objective was to understand the operational characteristics of this integrated unit of interdependent tissues. 
and to understand how the unit operates. And during the stretch shorten cycle, a, a cycle observed in almost every human movement pattern. And all of this collectively to potentially influence the sport performance, improve the sport performance. Indeed, effective neuromechanical coupling between these tissues is essential to effective motor control. And I believe Pavel understood this very clearly. We have physiology questions here. How does the integrated sensory motor system operate? Specifically, how does the stretch shorten cycle operate? What affects the output of the stretch shorten cycle? And how is the output of the triceps surae during the stretch shorten cycle controlled? Would this unit, if trained appropriately, benefit performance of any given individual in any given activity? That moves us on to performance level questions. How does the performance of the stretch shorten cycle improve athletic performance? Can its benefits to performance be explained to athletes and coaches? Can the stretch shorten cycle be trained? And would modified training paradigms suggest changes in equipment design? We all know that's a handshake between a human machine and the equipment that they use. In order to achieve the central objective of understanding the output characteristics of this system, Pavel was very aware that an integrated team of scientists, each with their own individual knowledge base, must be gathered together to approach the problem. Just as the individual tissues in this system have different properties, they must act together. And just as the team of scientists that approach questions related to this have independent individual knowledge bases, they too must work together in order to solve the problem. And this also, I think, Pablo knew very, very well. The second aspect of his professional career that I want to talk about is his approach to collaborative research. And this is illustrated by his passion for mentoring, individual career impact, in other words, he wanted to work with people and impact their career as a scientist, whether they're young, mid-career, students, and more importantly, transmitting knowledge to the coaches and the athletes. Evidence of mentoring, some examples. First of all, his development of an interdisciplinary research lab, so to speak. He uh, had this approach and provided this environment for his students a very holistic, comprehensive view of how to approach problems in human movement. So that's one thing about mentoring. They were in that environment, and they learned from that environment, and he led those questions in that environment. Also, I want to highlight his strong participation in the, in the development of the European College of Sports Science, which is in 95, uh, 96. The principal objective of that development of that Congress, of that college, was to perform, uh, allow a platform for students to perform and give their research results. Again, it's mentoring. He's trying to help students. And he, and he works with a group of excellent scientists to develop the European College of Sports Science for that reason. The other thing we talked about was impacting individual careers. And I'll tell you my story first. Uh, I met Pavel Comey in uh, 1970, 1971, a long time ago, at Penn State, the biomechanics lab. When I was a student, I started there. And he happened to be visiting the, uh, he happened to be visiting the, uh, the lab, and uh, we talked about many, many things. Uh, I was mostly interested in his electromechanical delay literature, and his force velocity literature, which he was, and EMG literature, which he was in at the time. And, um, we both had common interests in physiology and biomechanics, and that's what we talk about the most. And we met at meetings after that, and I eventually asked him, invited him to be a professor, visiting professor at UCLA, which he did. And uh, he taught a seminar there for our students, and we had three basic outcomes. Our discussions during that period resulted in three basic outcomes. The first of, first of which I have noted on this slide. So the initial uh, discussions emerged from our discussions about force production in skeletal muscle. And you can see on the left-hand slide a uh, hind limb model of a cat, which we were doing at the time. We had developed at UCLA around 1980. 
We used force buckles, as people had done prior to us, to study individual muscle force production and load sharing and neural control in the hind limb. So we started that some time ago. We did a, and then the key to this slide, however, though, is, is the fact that when Pablo visited us, we had those discussions, but he was the one uh, provided a unique and novel extension of that technology to human subjects. So he was very interested and very passionate about human performance. So that's on the right side of the slide. We studied the sport of cycling. It's a model. This is the buckle we used, similar to that one that we used in the hind limb. And yes, that is my ankle at the center of this slide. My right ankle with a buckle transducer on it, Pablo was pretty convincing, and uh, I loaned it to him for a while, about four hours, uh, outpatient at the UKK Institute in Finland. I really enjoyed the working with him, so this was, was on loan, though. Two major findings we had of that work. Noted on the left here, we discovered that the triceps sore contributed 70% to the net moment at the ankle, we uh, calculated through inverse dynamic solutions. So about 70%, and that was pretty constant at a, three different power outputs, changing cadence and changing load. That was the percent that the triceps sura contributed to. A second one, of course, when you work with power, you do stretch shorten cycle. So we did that here, and you'll notice the two muscles, the uh, major muscles that contribute to that force at the tendon have different activation periods, onsets and cessation and different stretch shorten cycles, but the fact that they do have stretch shorten cycles is important. This is, uh, as you can note, 270 watts at 90 RPM. So this is the first out of our initial discussions. The second thing was uh, he suggested to us at UCLA that we hold a Congress in ISB for the ISB. So we made a proposal to the ISB. They accepted it, and we held, uh, Ron Zernicke and I co-chaired that Congress in 1989, just 30 short years ago today, or this summer. And uh, the last thing there, the third one, the IOC projects in 1984, I'm going to talk a little bit more about those in a little while. So this is my own story. Um, there are other stories just like mine, many other stories just like mine, where we impacted careers. And a broader uh, experience, specific to a broader audience here, in this neuromuscular aspects of sport performance, which I believe is still a textbook for students at the MS level in Uvasco, that is true, thank you. Um, he brought together 24 different authors, colleagues, <coughs> 16 different manuscripts. Pavel was an author on eight of them, you can read here. Activities included locomotion cycling, as we just discussed, and cross-country skiing which Pavel was very passionate about. He was very active in the sports community, especially in cross-country skiing. He's a passionate skier and an active member of the Finnish Ski Association. In this book, we have <coughs> excuse me, a broad range of topics as well. You can note here in these topics, we go from trans uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation to individual muscle function in vivo. So a broad range of topics that collectively he brought these people together which is uh, evidence of his collaborative efforts and his ability to work with people. The third thing we talk about is transmitting knowledge. So we had the mentoring, impact on careers, and transmitting knowledge. This is an example of working with coaches and athletes. And of course, when you do that, you're involved in equipment design, the handshake between the human machine and the skis themselves in this case. And you're interested in the human machine, and Pavel worked with uh, Professor <coughs> excuse me, Ishikawa in Japan. They use ultrasound on selected muscles in the lower extremity, and therefore they're looking at changes in fascicle lengths while they're doing this controlled environment of cross-country skiing, which is on the le uh, right, left-hand side of this slide. On the right-hand side of this slide, uh, Bob Norman, who's here with us, uh, worked with Pavel you can see the title of that article, Stretch Shortening Cycles in Cross-Country Skiing. It's a book. And they were interested in the function of the stretch shorten cycle and in very important questions related to how they could impact cross-country skiing. So we dealt with a physical interface here, the skis, and now we deal with an intellectual interface, the data and ideas 
that are transmitted to coaches and athletes. And some important questions were raised here. Norman and Comey suggested, presented strong evidence that supports the feasibility and the value of exploiting the stretch shorten cycle in cross-country skiing. And they also made a suggestion that uh, it was time, they concluded it was time for the coaches to teach skiers how to use the stretch shorten cycle patterns in their skiing. So this is directly back to the coaches and athletes. This is information they gain in the lab, in controlled environments, and this is the information they gave back. So mentoring, <coughs> individual careers impacted, and transmitting knowledge, all part of his collaboration efforts. The third aspect, the last aspect of his career, is his uh, professional contributions at the national and international levels. And I'm going to highlight here the reorganization of the Medical Commission in 1980, the IOC Medical Commission. And the reorganization created three subcommissions. They wanted to more or less move away a little bit from doping and present a more positive image to the athletic community. So they developed the sports medicine and orthopedics. And I'm going to focus on biomechanics and physiology of sport. There are five original members on that committee, subcommission. You can read the names here. There's some pictures there. Uh, Pavel Komi, of course, was seminal to this committee in terms of his efforts and his work in a variety of areas, as we've already discussed. So he was an important member of this subcommission. And we had discussions about that in 1984, which was the third outcome of our discussions at that time. And we discussed what sport areas would be, uh, where data would coll be collected at the 1984 games what sports areas, so he had gymnastics, athletics, and weightlifting. And of course, Jim Hay was active in the horizontal jumps, as he's been for many, many years. And he was part of that team in 1984 in the athletics, along with Ralph Mann and Bill Whiting. So we have this information. We've made a stand as, as to uh, collecting data in international competition, especially at the Olympic Games. And we would publish that initially in the International Journal of Sports Biomechanics and a Journal of Applied Biomechanics. You can see the beginnings of our publications from those data. And I've highlighted ski jumping here on the, uh, the fourth bullet there, because we did speed skating, Nordic skiing. This was at the Calgary Games. And notice LA Olympic Games, Seoul Olympic Games, and the Calgary Games were all included here. So ski jumping is highlighted here as an example of national to international competition, national to international influence in his work. And Pavel had a team, a ski jumping team, and you can see the date started in 1986 and went to 2012, a span of many years, though he was influence, he would influence skiing locally, of course, because he was very active locally, but also nationally, internationally, because his team was responsible primarily for the data collection at the Olympic Games is a list of jumping projects performed at the Winter Olympic Games. And again, we started right here at Calgary in 1988. We have a calibration frame here and a frame uh, where we, uh, they, they uh, were trying to further isolate the plates a little bit from the snow. But Calgary, Lillehammer, Nagano, Park City, and Torino. So Pavel had a long span of influence, not only nationally, but internationally. And his team had that same uh, interest his collaborations and working with that team, very positive outcomes. So in summary, in summary, of these three aspects that come together, three aspects of his career, the interdisciplinary approach, the collaborative approach, and now the approach to national and international competition, he enriched our understanding he enriched our standing, understanding of neuromuscular and musculoskeletal systems as an integrated system. This was the science of his work. He understood this and he enriched our understanding about that. Second thing was he developed interdisciplinary teams. This is part of his working with people, his collaborative work. Very enjoyable to work with him. I think we could all make testimony to that who've done that. The third thing, pursued questions. 
He was passionate about human performance and pursued those questions as I discussed with the buckle transducers and Dr. Finney will talk further about that in the second talk here. That's the curiosity which we all have, but he was passionate about it. And the fourth thing, transmitting knowledge. Pablo was in a very unique position as a player, so to speak, in some of these activities. Not only athletics, but skiing, Nordic skiing. Um, he was very active in that and passionate about improving the sport and in bringing other people in to study that sport to improve it. So Pavo truly enjoyed his 50 plus years with colleagues, friends, and family, balancing his work ethic with a lot of fun. And I can attest to that. He really enjoyed, I have some pictures here of uh, friends, uh, some of you know these people. Um, I think Raya and Pavo at the center is appropriate, uh, his family. And I have also a shout out to some of the people here with uh, that I'd like to thank for helping me with, me with this presentation. So thank you. And Taya. Thank you. Uh, my part of this talk will be focusing more on the scientific contributions. In a way, um, I took analytical tools to look at the metrics of his career as well, but also provide insight that I have from working with him and discussing with uh, his colleagues um, uh, what we know about his major research topics and passion for research. As Dr. Gregor presented, Pavel was promoting multidisciplinary research from the very beginning. When looking at his publication record from Web of Science, where 20, uh, 265 of his uh, many more publications are listed, the sports sciences is the uh, main topic that was already much elaborated by Dr. Greger, especially regarding winter sports. Naturally, this section contains also research related to basic neuromus uh, neuromuscular function during human movement. Physiological studies include Nordic collaboration in the 70s, examining skeletal muscle physiology in twins, uh, but mainly different aspects of human performance, including various aspects of fatigue, Examples of research in neuroscience include the use of various EMG methods and studies on stretch reflexes. This figure shows the number of publications in chronological order. The very first publications dealt with methodology of wire and surface electrodes that Pavo did with Buschkirk. His first PhD student was Heikki Rusko, uh, whose work was on physical performance characteristics of Finnish co cross-country skiers and ski jumpers with the purpose to create a test battery for neuromuscular aerobic and anaerobic aspects of physical performance, both at the whole body level down to the muscle fiber composition. This record year followed by his, uh, followed his sabbatical in 84, 85 in Freiburg, Germany, where, uh, and his sub subsequent visit by Albert Kolhofer to Jyväskylä, uh, enabling the record year of 20 publications in 87. This increase in productivity in early 2000 was linked to the period when total of 11 PhD students defended their thesis within eight years. And in our system, each PhD thesis comprised of six to four uh, previously six, now four publications, um, uh, original articles. Pavo's later work focused on aging effects on neuromuscular and bone function. And uh, one significant effort was uh, the Kenyan runners 
uh, distant runners project that was done in collaboration with the French-Japanese collaboration. This is a word cloud uh, from article title by Pavel. So all the uh, words in a articles that he published produces this uh, word cloud. And the major research themes such as neuromuscular characteristics, muscle mechanics, training adaptations, and especially the stretch shorten cycle <coughs> are depicted in this word, word cloud quite nicely. So the stretch shorten <coughs> story originate from Pavo's early career when he followed the technique of Asmussen and von de Petersen to assess maximal vertical jumps on a force platform with and without free stretch. The early studies with Bosco and Aura led to studies of on uh, mechanical efficiency and its dependence uh, of elastic potentiation. Jumps of different amplitudes and contribution of muscle activity was also studied. Together with uh, Bosco, he published this article on elastic energy utilization that is the second most cited article by Pavo. Also, Pavo's most, article, uh, most cited article comes from this era with Bosco and Pekka Luhtanen. They reported a repetitive jump test to assess mechanical power in jumping <coughs> and compared it to the Wingate test and a 60-meter dash. The power values in jumps were found greater than the other two tests, and this was discussed in the context of metabolic versus mechanical power. Bosco also developed other devices that were very useful in assessing jumping and squat, squatting power. <coughs> the stretch on cycle studies were then developed further together with Albert Golhofer to study fatigue and the significance of stretch reflex contributions. This experiment highlighted the differences in fatigue and reflex contributions in submaximal and maximal conditions. This line of research was followed by many of Pavo's PhD students, Caroline Nigol, Janne Avela, Tomoki Horita, to mention few. <coughs> then with Heikki Kyrölainen, the work focused on mechanical efficiency and thus integrating exercise physiology and neuromuscular biomechanics. From this work, it was found that in eccentric muscle action, mechanical effic efficiency is not constant, <coughs> but it's increased along with free stretch velocity. And further, the uh, <coughs> further that the uh, a magnitude of mechanical efficiency in the concentric phase is dependent on the coupling time between the eccentric and concentric phases. <coughs> a big group of researchers from U Vascular went to Nice in 1989 to study marathon running and were hosted by Professor Marconet. Subsequently, various SSC fatigue models were done in Uvascula, and this experiment by Avela et al. down here showed the reduced stretch reflex, uh, uh, stretch reflex response and voluntary activation after exhaustive exercise. With Caroline Nicole, Pavo quantified the mechanical consequences of stretch reflex in the ankle ergometer setup using the buckle transducer. Uh, they also reported the actual electromechanical delay. Pavo had, had a long interest in this issue, and the 1979 publication on electromechanical delay with Peter Kavanagh is among his uh, most cited uh, articles. Albert Golhofer told me that if you wanted to get Pavo angry, you could talk about electromechanical delay. As an experimentalist, when Pavo was discussing with the people doing modeling and simulations, he noted that there should be no shifting of EMG signal because the delay is a natural phenomenon. In 1997, there was a review published by the Dutch group that received responses from several research groups. Pavo tackled the text on reflexes in response with Albert Golhofer. The difference in opinion came from that Pavo's group thought that the reflexes contributed to the performance, while the Dutch group thought that the stretch reflexes cannot be operative during short contact times. 
Unfortunately, Professor von Ingenschenau passed away before understanding could be found. In 1992, I invited Art Hoff from the Dutch uh, group um, to the Uvascular Annual Symposium to give a talk. And when he heard Pavo's talk about reflexes, he told me that he had never realized that Pavo felt so strongly and was so passionate about the stretch reflexes. Today, there are several suggested mechanisms playing a part in the stretch shortened cycle effects and Pavo's research contributed to the elastic energy utilization, optimal pre-activation and uh, reflex contribution, short coupling time between the eccentric and concentric phases, and enhanced muscle activation on time for it. In vivo measurements of human tender muscular forces were important in characterizing muscle tendon function during natural locomotion and to understand the performance potentiation during stretch shortened cycle. That was the driving idea to go uh, to do these experiments in humans. And Pavo served as a first uh, subject, but no recordings uh, could be done. But subsequently, uh, successful recordings were done, and uh, they were published together with uh, Bob Gregor, Senshi Fukashiro, Caroline Nicole, and Heike Kurolainen, for example. The fiber optic tra uh, force transducer was developed together with Alain Belli from France, and studies using this method uh, were published uh, by Tony Arndt and myself, for example. Here you see Pavo watching how the calibration of the optic fiber works. In his MyBridge talk here in Calgary 20 years ago, it was about stretch shortened cycle, and this video was part of his presentation back then. Um, it was still time to, of the double uh, slide projectors, uh, but Pavo wanted something new, so I uh, prepared this video for him, uh, illustrating how the Achilles and patella tendon loading uh, during small amplitude hopping uh, uh, showing this uh, instantaneous force velocity curves. Pavo illustrated the enhanced concentric performance using this slide very often in his presentations as a concept figure. Uh, while you see here a uh, compilation of the different uh, uh, the curves from different studies that uh, were measured in vivo. One thing the audience should know is that the classical curve is drawn arbitrarily. Uh, to the experimental data, and as such, the figure does not correctly represent the magnitude of the potentiation in the concentric phase. Uh, and the comparable curves of the instantaneous and classic curves were presented in my PhD thesis uh, and the publication in 2003. So these curves show that at the muscle tendon unit level, the stretch shorten cycle potentiates force as compared to the isokinetic concentric force. And while we look at this at the fascicle level, of course, the classical curve was not exceeded. I want to make some personal notes about Pavo's mentorship. In his biography, Pavo tells that the idea to help literature seminars for students came from his time in US. <coughs> he, he, he writes there that uh, this method, giving students articles to read and be presented, must <coughs> contain something something that makes the students learn about science. And from the very beginning, he supported his students for international connections and visits abroad. Well, for me, he didn't really want me to go, and, but he eventually recovered that I, I left for, to UCLA to do my postdoc there. Um, but really, the scientific legacy, I think, uh, lies and lives uh, through Pavo's students. In total, he supervised 28 students, according to my records, but he did not have this information in his CV, so it may, be, it may not be a complete list. It's amazing how many of them currently hold professors or associate professorships today, and also many of them, the remaining students, have remained in academia. I wanna end uh, with this picture 
that is in the wall of our laboratory, showing how international group of people were doing research with him in Yuvaskula in the good old days. In Bavo's biography, he told that in his first trip to Brazil to a conference in 1976, a person speaking before him was Jim Hay. Without hesitation, I say that Bavo would have been greatly honored to receive this recognition today. Thank you. So I'm going to say just a few words in my capacity as president of the American Society of Biomechanics. Um, my name is Brian Umberger. And um, I would first like to thank uh, Professor Gregor and Professor Finney for sharing those uh, uh, really touching personal and professional reflections on, on an amazing scientist. Um, and would also like to thank uh, uh, Professor McNick Gray and the rest of the Hay Awards Committee for organizing this and, and making this uh, excellent selection. And um, I had the pleasure of getting to meet Jim Hay very early in my career. Uh, I never met Pavo Komi personally, although I had the chance to see him give some keynote lectures, including I think the 99 Citation Award that Bob mentioned. Uh, but you can impact people in many ways. And when I first got into the field and had an interest in muscle mechanics, uh, Pavo's work was some of the first that I came across, including very early on, a paper he did in, published in 1973 when I was in preschool and technology was not quite what it is now, uh, doing ex extremely rigorous work on identifying uh, in vivo force velocity properties. This was work in the, actually in the biceps and the elbow flexor muscles. It's much more well known, I think, for lower extremity muscle work. And that was one of those moments you have when things click for you and you early on in your career, you, you really understand that, oh, you can do rigorous work in this area and there's people doing things maybe beyond your classes you're taking, your institution, and that's something that, that really uh, influenced me early on and stuck with me. Um, so the Hay Award typically has a $1,000 check that is presented to the Hay awardee, and given the circumstances this year, I'm happy to announce that instead, ASB will be making a $1,000 donation in Pavo Comey's name. Specifically, later this year, there will be the Pavo Comey Memorial Symposium at the University of Devascula, uh, and we will be making the donation in a manner that supports student awards at that symposium. And so I want to thank Professor Finney for helping us make the necessary connections to ensure that that works out. Um, so uh, my remarks are done. I am going to turn it over now to Professor McNick Gray, uh, who is going to lead, I believe, a question and open discussion period. So thank you. So we left some time at the end to give people an opportunity to come to the podium for recording this. And so if you could be able to have some remarks or personal experiences or that kind of thing that we'd like to share, we'd like to invite you to come up and say a few words. Or I can bring a mic to you. Pavel might have been a serious scientist, but he also had a sense of humor. In fact, for the famous Dick and Dewey Awards, Pavel was always extremely insightful in coming up with original suggestions. We hope to continue this tr tradition tonight. On the particular occasion that's being referred to, I think, I first met Pavel on the Calgary 70 meter jump and he had a saw in hand 
and a plank that he was kneeling on, sewing down the ski jump takeoff along one side of an eight meter force platform. And I said, Pavo, who did you ask for permission to do this? And uh, he said, Fred, in my experience, I find it best not to ask permission in case they say no. <laughs> anyway, I think what happened was Pavo got thrown off the hill and then later on he came back and cut down the other side. So we had these visions of when the first competitor went down the 70 meter jump, he would be jumping along with an eight meter piece of uh, snow. But this didn't happen. Everything turned out all right and it was a fine job. Would it be better to pass around or you can do this? So I'm Brian Davis from Cleveland State University. Um, so the, my first I, um, ISB meeting was 1987, I think along with Ton van den Bogert at the back there. Um, and so that's when I first got to know about the name Peter, Ka um, not, um, Peter Kavanagh, <laughs> Pava Komi. Um, and he was a legend in, at ISB at that time anyway. So I, just by a show of hands, how many here are or have been presidents of national societies, ASB, ISB, or any other society? President, yeah. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I think that's incredible that he has this reputation for reaching out across the world. Um, yeah, so, my <laughs> so I'm not a stretch shortening cycle person, um, but there was a time when I had to cal calculate um, forces in a astronaut harness. So you might be thinking that's not something Pava was involved in, but it was a harness flown on the space station and the Russians did not want us to cut the harness. So how would you measure the forces in a harness without cutting the straps? Do you know how we did it? <laughs> we used the buckle transducer that Pava Komi had published on, and you as well. So you wouldn't think that research into a stretch shortening cycle or measuring the forces in the Achilles tendon would be used in a completely different application. But I'm standing here saying that Pavo's contributions spread way beyond muscle, including measuring um, how much force is transmitted to a national shoulder during exercise on a treadmill using a buckle transducer that Pavo um, made popular. So, yeah, so once again, his research was widespread. The other thing I'll say is that besides going to the 1987 meeting um, in Amsterdam, I also went to the meeting in Evascular in 1995. And I remember just Pavo being so proud of the whole sports science institute that he had set up there. Um, and it was, how many of you have seen the sports science building? Okay, so probably a third of the room. It was incredible. It was a testimony to what one person can do. And, and we, we've seen his publications and how many conferences he attended. But just that whole sports science building and the breadth of things that were going on there was incredible. Um, so... That was, my, that was the first and only time I've ever been to Finland. Um, but just being in, the, you know, I, so as I said, I don't know Pavo personally, but just being in a conference like that, where he was obviously so proud of what he had achieved in Evascular and proud of what he'd done for the ISB and for science in general was just inspiring. So for me, it's one of those things where one person may not realize the impact he or she has on others, but it's, it's like a ripple effect. One person has creates a wave that just 
spreads out around the world. So, yeah, so once again, I just thank the organizers for doing this. Uh, I think I think Pavo was an incredible person, as was Jim Hay. Um, so I'm sure others have personal recollections they can mention, but <laughs> for me, he was just an inspiring type person. I'd like to thank the organizers, too. My relationship, as Bob, Bob mentioned, goes back to the early 70s at Penn State, where I first met Bob and Pablo at about the same time. And I was trying to think of what incident to tell you about, and I couldn't uh, decide particularly between the eight-kilometer canoe trip we took downstream on a river in Kitchener-Waterloo, Ontario. My name is Bob Norman, by the way. Maybe I said that already. I just checked my, <laughs> that's what it says. Or the 20 kilometer trip, Pavo decided we should take in Russia, just on the Russian border between Finland and Russia, where the guide said, uh, look to the left, your picture is being taken by the Russians. <laughs> or the mosquito infested place at our cottage in Muskoka, north of Toronto, a couple of hours by car where we sent Pavo out to do the barbecuing because we knew he was used to mosquitoes in Uvascula. <laughs> My first trip to Finland uh, for a six or seven month sabbatical was about 1978, I think, or there, thereabouts. And uh, I arrived with my six and eight year old son and wife. We had taken the children out of school on a Friday, put them in a Finnish school where they didn't understand a word on Monday morning, Pavo said, now we go to Lati. They said, where's Lati? Uh, international ski conference, uh, competition in Lati. It's a city between Helsinki and Uvascula. So there we are in the cold collecting film data on Finnish skiers, some Canadian skiers, some other world-class skiers who are likely to win. And at the end, we were freezing, and he took me to my very first sauna in Finland. And this was a very big sauna. There were men and women, maybe 20, 30 people. I've got two incidents to tell you about the sauna. Nobody had any clothes on. And I hear this voice behind me. I'm sitting on the first bench, the first story. And the voice is, in Finland, it is necessary for all foreigners to keep eyes straight forward. <laughs> so I kept my eyes straight forward. There's none of this going on. And the second one was, and I have to apologize to the Swiss in the room. I know there's at least one and maybe more. So there was a, a, a guy who I think was a technician from Switzerland because it was a joint project between the Finns and the Swiss. And this man said, uh, and you can imitate my Canadian accent, this is my, fit in my Swiss accent. He says, in Switzerland, we sit on first bench three minutes, then on second bench three minutes. There were three benches in this sauna. Then on third bench three minutes, and then on second bench three minutes, then on first bench three minutes, then we go out. And Pavo said, in Finland, when we get too hot, we go out. <laughs> <laughs> I had many, many experiences with Pavel and Raya in their home in Finland, in their cottage, which is their home now, in Finland, watching Pavel go up and down an elevator in Uvascula that wouldn't stop, and every now and there was a window, and we see his head go up, and then it would go down again. <laughs> it eventually got stopped. Uh, we had many, many wonderful experiences in Canada, in our home, and uh, it's too bad Pablo is gone. So, in uh, Akamin, Huvasti.
just to make sure that you hear a real Swiss accent. <laughs> I had many, many experiences with Pavo, but one of them, probably nobody knows about that. We owned a house in the Engadin near St. Moritz, that's up in the mountains of Switzerland, beautiful ski area. And I decided to invite a few people when I was a young biomechanist to come to that house for a workshop. And that was in 1976. I started in biomechanics in 1971. And I looked around and identified people that I thought would do good work and invited them for a ski holiday. And it was Pavel Komi, it was Jim Hay, it was Dick Nelson, it was Günther Rau and myself. And we had skiing during the day and at four o'clock in the afternoon we had a workshop from four till eight and then we went for dinner. And the topic was that each of us had to speak about four hours on what they want to do. And just imagine if you would have to do that, to say what you want to do and speak four hours, and people would ask you a question. So it was highly interesting to hear all these people, what they said. That was in 1976, and uh, I don't know who of you knows Pavo, but whenever Pavo said something that was important, he put the head a little bit to the side and <laughs> spoke like that, and then he came back. Anyway, we had our plans, and 10 years later, we invited the same group with their wives again to our house, and the topic was exactly the same, skiing during the day and four hours in the afternoon, and everybody had to tell what they did, which was rather interesting. And if you have any possibility with your colleagues to do that, you should do that. It's really exciting. The interesting thing was that there were two people in the group that predicted exactly what they wanted to do. That was Jim Hay and Pablo Komi. I mean, they at the end said, yes, yes, yes. And there are some people in the group that did different things and, and good things, but it was an interesting experience. And you can imagine that you get to know people very well if, if you ski with them and then you talk with them about biomechanics for four hours and then you have a good dinner. That was my experience. So I will close with my own personal experience as a young scientist. And I'd like to thank all of the people that he mentored. Because if you look at the names up there, I think if you look not only at the primary principal investigator, but the mentoring and the fostering of many people's careers and how that just really um, has really enriched our, our area. And I'm very thankful for the brave people who found a way to collect data um, during the Olympic Games because it's really hard to recreate the Olympics in your lab. And if you're really looking at that interface between control and dynamics and what happens when it really counts, it's a wonderful opportunity to really see human performance at its best in an international stage. And I know a number of the people that have been mentioned today have really made that possible. And I know that's given great insight as how we go forward, especially in the area of sports biomechanics. So thank you all for being here today. And thank you all for taking, being brave and um, sharing some of your stories. I think it's really important. And um, anyways, I'd like to thank you for being here to celebrate Pavakomi.